In the annals of history, there are many great defeats that live on in the cultural memory. I mean, after all, any great victory by one side often represents a great defeat for another. And among the great defeats in history, perhaps none has remained more famous than one during the Second Punic War, when the general Hannibal crossed the Alps intent on destroying Rome. In a series of brilliant strategic victories, Hannibal threatened the very existence of the Roman Republic, but perhaps he never came closer to finally destroying his foe than when he met an unprecedented eight Roman legions in August of 216 BC on the fields of Italia near the tiny village of Cannae. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The end of the First Punic War was an embarrassing defeat for Carthage. The harsh terms of the peace treaty inspired an even greater hatred of Rome, and Carthage set out to capture new lands in Iberia, which would provide it with new wealth and a base for a future war of revenge against the Romans. Carthaginian general Hamilcar Barca led the invasion of Iberia, and after nine years of fighting had captured much of the southeastern portion of the peninsula before he was killed in battle in 228 BC. The Romans demanded the Carthaginians cease their expansion, in 221 BC, Hamilcar's son, then 26 years old, was given command of the Carthaginian army. That son was Hannibal. Hannibal quickly subdued most of the Iberian Peninsula. Hannibal would go to great lengths to plan his attack on Rome. He made allies in Italy, which gave him guides and conductors through the difficult passes of the Alps. Hannibal fought a campaign from the Pyrenees to the Alps successfully. Using the land route to Italy, while difficult, also allowed the Carthaginians to avoid Roman supremacy at sea. It isn't known exactly what route Hannibal used to cross the Alps, but crossed them he did, arriving in Italy in the fall of 218 BC. Thus began a devastating campaign. He defeated the Romans in the Battle of Trebia, nearly encircling and destroying most of the force, and the following year destroyed another Roman army in an ambush, killing around 15,000 Roman soldiers and capturing 10,000 more. The Romans elected Quintus Fabius Maximus dictator for their defense. Panic was rising in Rome. Fabius enacted his famous Fabian strategy, refusing to be drawn into a major engagement while wearing down the Carthaginian force through minor skirmishes and giving Rome time to recover. Meanwhile, Hannibal was devastating some of the richest parts of the Roman state and drawing Roman allies to his side. Sick of what they saw as cowardice, in 216 BC the Romans did not renew Fabius' dictatorship and elected new consuls, Gaius Tertius Varro, who advocated for an aggressive strategy, and Lucius Aemilius Paulus. Hannibal wanted an engagement, and in 216 he seized a base near Cannae, which had a citadel and a supply depot. Polybius writes that it caused great commotion in the Roman army, for it was not only the loss of the place and the stores in it that distressed them, but the fact that it commanded the surrounding district. Cut off from a major source of supplies, the Roman army could not displace Hannibal without committing to an engagement. Varro and Paulus were sent with instructions from the Senate to bring Hannibal's army to battle at last. The army that Rome raised to fight at Cannae was unprecedented. According to Polybius, the Romans habitually enrolled four legions per year of up to 5,000 heavy infantry apiece and 200 cavalry apiece, along with an equal number of allied troops. Most of Rome's wars are decided by one consul and two legions. They rarely employ all four at one time and on one service. However, Hannibal was seen as so great a threat that Rome sent both consuls and eight legions, around 90,000 men. There were difficulties for such a large army, however. Usually, consuls would command their own separate legions, but since all eight legions were combined into a single army, Roman law required that the consuls alternate command of the army on a daily basis. Traditionally, Varro is believed to have been in command on the day of the battle. The exact numbers of soldiers engaged at the battle are not fully certain. Most of the information we have today about the Second Punic War comes from Polybius, who is usually considered a trustworthy and relatively objective source, however, not a perfect one. Polybius puts 86,400 men at the battle, about 80,000 infantry and 6,400 cavalry. The exact makeup of Hannibal's force is even more uncertain and drawn from many mercenaries and local troops, but probably wasn't more than 50,000 men. All of the ancient sources agree that Hannibal was significantly outnumbered. The exact date of the battle is uncertain as well. Roman pontifices who led the region inserted leap weeks, years or days improperly, either accidentally or for political reasons, meaning that even when a date is given, it's often impossible to translate that into the modern calendar. What we do know is that the battle took place in the summer of 216 BC. Polybius says that Varro, from inexperience, ignored his colleagues' advice and marched to engage the Carthaginians in an open, flat field, a disadvantage for the Romans because Hannibal had the superior cavalry force. The battle took place on one side of the modern Ophanto River. The Romans sent about a third of their force across the river. Varro arranged his men in the traditional fashion, infantry in the center with cavalry on each flank. He shortened the line in favor of a deeper infantry formation, hoping to break the Carthaginian line at the center. 
Hannibal was well aware of traditional Roman tactics and took advantage of them to arrange his army. He placed his slingers behind his infantry to attack the Roman mass infantry with his own Carthaginian infantry on the flanks and mercenary and local troops at the center. Hannibal stood front and center of the whole army. According to historians Appian and Livy, he sent several hundred mercenaries to pretend to desert to the Romans, who would cause chaos in the Roman rear during the battle, but their accounts are considered less reliable. Hannibal used the river to anchor one flank. The Romans would be facing east, into the rising sun, and prevailing wind would blow dirt in their faces. Hannibal chose his battlefield well. As the two armies faced each other, Plutarch reports a tale that a Carthaginian soldier named Gizgo expressed his shock at the larger Roman force. There is one thing, Gizgo, yet more astonishing, which you take no notice of, Hannibal replied. In all those great numbers before us, there is not one man called Gizgo. As the infantry began to march, the battle was opened with fighting on the flanks by the cavalry. The Carthaginian cavalry destroyed one flank easily, while the second flank delayed the Roman cavalry long enough that the victorious cavalry from the other flank could cross behind the Romans and rout the remaining Roman cavalry. Meanwhile, the Carthaginian line advanced unevenly, forming a crescent with the weaker Carthaginian center nearest the Roman lines. The Romans faced several disadvantages, the sun, the dust, and thirst thanks to a Carthaginian attack on Roman water supplies the previous day. When the strong Roman center met the Carthaginian center, Hannibal led his men in a slow reverse, a controlled retreat that drew the Romans into the center of the line, until the Carthaginian center formed a crescent facing the opposite direction, with the Romans jammed within the Carthaginian lines. Whether driven by their apparent victory over the Carthaginian center or possibly obscured by the dust, the Romans failed to appreciate the African infantry on their opponent's flanks, who were left unengaged. As the Romans poured past them into the center, the veteran Carthaginians struck the Roman flanks and enveloped the Roman rear, supported by the Carthaginian cavalry. The Roman force was entirely surrounded. Morale collapsed. Hannibal ordered his men into a wall, which closed in on every side. According to Polybius, 70,000 Romans were killed, 10,000 captured, and only a few thousand escaped. Livy reports differently, saying closer to 50,000 were killed and some 20,000 captured, with around 14,000 escaping. His source likely being a soldier who fought in the war who he had consulted in the past. Polybius reports only 5,700 Carthaginians were killed in the fighting. Livy says Hannibal lost 8,000. For Rome, the loss was nearly complete. Officers, consuls, and senators died in the fighting, including Paulus, although Varro was able to escape. Never when the city was in safety was there so great a panic and confusion within the walls of Rome, Livy wrote of the aftermath. Now there was neither any Roman camp, nor general, nor soldiery. Almost the whole of Italy was in the possession of Hannibal. The Romans were so panicked that they turned to human sacrifice, twice burying people alive at the Roman Forum. Nearly a fifth of Rome's entire population of males over 17 had died in the fighting, and many cities in southern Italy defected to Hannibal following the defeat, the city's despairing of Roman power. Hannibal refused to march directly on Rome. Livy writes that one of Hannibal's commanders exasperatedly declared that you know how to conquer Hannibal, but you do not know how to make use of your victory. But he had little chance of taking Rome itself, and Rome was far from defeated, did not sue for peace. The allied lands that had defected to Hannibal provided little in the way of manpower, and Carthage only reinforced him once during the whole year. He was expected to protect his new allies with the same number of soldiers while Rome had time to rebuild. Eight legions had been unprecedented but Rome took drastic steps to raise more troops. And just a year after Cannae, Rome fielded 12 legions. By 212 BC, there were more than 200,000 Roman troops and allies deployed, many of them in Italy, where they deployed in field armies of about 20,000, which made it difficult for Hannibal to act freely. Cannae led to the reshaping of Rome's military doctrine. Units were reorganized, and the importance of a unified command recognized. Scipio Africanus, who had also escaped Cannae, was made general-in-chief of Roman armies in Africa and guaranteed that role for the duration of the war. Scipio would bring the Roman army to Africa and defeat Carthage decisively at the Battle of Zama, where Hannibal was finally defeated. He would die years later in Turkey. The battle has had many admirers since, becoming one of the most studied strategies in Western military history. Historian Will Durant said the battle set the lines of military tactics for 2,000 years. The double envelopment, or pincer movement, at Cannae is often considered one of the greatest battlefield maneuvers in history. Battles of annihilation on the scale and success of Cannae are rare. Dwight Eisenhower wrote that every ground commander seeks the battle of annihilation. He tries to duplicate in modern war the classic example of Cannae. The concept of such a maneuver was sought after nearly 2,000 years later by men such as Frederick the Great. German General Alfred von Schlieffen, whose Schlieffen plan would guide Germany's strategy in the World War I invasion of France, was inspired by Hannibal's strategy at Cannae. 
While not necessarily well known among the general public, the Battle of Cannae is still studied by military historians and modern strategists as a master lesson in strategy, including the psychological operation like denying the Roman army their water supply. Some modern historians have questioned whether the numbers that were supplied in Roman histories might have been exaggerated, whether armies that size really would have been practical in that era. And even some have argued that Hannibal's crescent attack wasn't actually some grand strategy, but merely the result of the, the force of the Roman attack. But in any case, Hannibal emerged from the Battle of Cannae with a historic reputation for brilliance. But ironically, it was the great defeat at Cannae that would lead to the rise of Rome, as it revealed weaknesses in the Republic that could be addressed. And the eventual Roman victory in the Second Punic War would guarantee Roman dominance in the Mediterranean for centuries to come. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.